Roger? What happened to Roger? He had to reboot his um, Chrome. Oh, no. So he re- oh, no. Yeah, so uh, if you're listening to the uh, the MP3, the patron uh, MP3, this is the, the gun mug that There's, we were talking about. Hey, Roger, look at that gun mug. Let me see. Let me see this mug. Oh, no picture yet. Oh. Now, yeah. the funny thing is it's got all these weird symbols that I, I think are supposed to be like, you know, ranch brands because it's very Western. But yeah. one of them is a peace symbol <laughs> 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 on your gun mug. Nailed it. I mean, honestly, I think it's supposed to be a Y brand, not a peace symbol, but it's funny. Hold on. Let me see. Yeah, Chrome is just mug. being obstinate here for a minute. All right. I've given you the... Uh, Requisite control. control. Yeah. Requisite control. Requisite gun troll. Gun troll. Oh, come on, wired. Everything is just not working with me today. All right. Hey, I'm going to hide. Okay. I think we're about ready, Scott. Are you? I'm so ready. It's just sad how ready I am. Sad. <laughs> yeah, I'm good. All right. Well, then, I'll take a sip of milk from my gun mug. Mm. That's what I always remember having in there was milk. Whole milk. Yep. It's a great place for it. Thing. All right. Here we go. The Daily Tech News Show is brought to you by people like me, not outside organizations. To learn more, go to dailytechnewsshow.com slash support. <laughs> This is the Daily Tech News for Wednesday, May 24th, 2017. I'm Todd Merritt. Joining me today, Mr. Scott Johnson. How are you, sir? Fabulous is the word I'm going to choose to use today. I feel great. I'm happy to be here. Sun's out. There's tech in the air. Let's do this. Let us do this. Yeah, we're going to be talking about Microsoft's new Game Pass uh, streaming game service. Although I misled you on the morning stream, Scott. Oh. Uh, I told you that it was both streaming and download, but uh, I read more into the fact, and it's just download. <clears throat> it's not All right. streaming. All right. That's but it, it is their competitor for PlayStation Now, which is a streaming service. Yeah, I, it is, it's an interesting take, and we'll talk about it more in length, but um, I, I feel like Microsoft's making small incremental moves toward trying to figure out how they can own 2017 or at least take back a little bit of lost ground. Well, let's start with a few other tech things you should know about. Intel announced it is integrating Thunderbolt 3 into Intel CPUs. That should make it a little more widespread. And it's making the Thunderbolt protocol spec available to third-party chip makers royalty-free next year. This is all trying to get Thunderbolt into more USB-C ports. Thunderbolt 3 can transfer data at 40 gigabits per second, roughly a 4K movie in 30 seconds. So so does this, I mean, I, uh, Thunderbolt felt like one of those weird in-betweeners that was just going to sort of be a thing and be real fast and everybody's excited. And then USB-C came along. I didn't realize that that Thunderbolt at the chip level could, uh, as a protocol, could actually enhance what we're getting out of USB-C ports. Yeah, those USB-C ports on the new MacBook Pros, also Thunderbolt 3 ports. Uh, see, that's good to know. All right. Uh, I learned something every day. How about learning this? Samsung Gear 360 video camera goes on sale May 25th. So get out your wallets, everybody, because it's going to set you back 229 bucks. It's been available for pre-order in the UK for 219 uh, pounds. The cu- the uh, camera does 360 uh, degree video in 4K, and uh, does that still with 15 megapixels? Yeah, still I images. Wa- yeah, I want to see it in in action. Um, I'm sure some sample video exists somewhere, but I just oh yeah, there's tons. They they showed it off at Mobile World Congress. So sure, I just want to see a guy like you do it, and then see what the results are. You know, I like gotcha. everyday use, is it worth my 230 bucks? That's what I want to know. Ikea's um, <clears throat> trod free, trod free, trod free, trad fry. Uh, T-R-A, well, I don't know that that's an A. It's an A with a little halo on it. Uh, D-F-R-I. Anyway, smart lights from Ikea are getting support for Google Home, Apple HomeKit, and Amazon Voice Services this summer or autumn. The lights first debuted in Europe uh, cheap smart lights that are cross-platform. Smart move, IKEA. I agree. This is what I've been waiting for. I love everything Philips and everybody else is doing. That's great and all, but I don't want to spend my life savings on automated home stuff. I would like to go buy some cheap crap at IKEA, even if it means it's only gonna last a couple of years. This is the true full rotation of uh, home stuff. So yes, thank you, IKEA, for finally getting into it. 
Let's get into some more top stories. Google announced Google Attribution, which uses machine learning to estimate how real-world video ads, banner ads, emails, and other materials contribute to a customer transaction. So instead of saying, well, they clicked this link and then they bought something, that's all we know, they can say, oh, well, they actually went into the store, and we know that from Beacon, and they got this circular in the mail, and then they went to the website, and then they clicked the buy link. And so now we have more information about them. Google Attribution is free in beta, but will eventually charge for enterprise pro deployment. Uh, but it's just AdSense, uh, more AdSense details for, for most people. Google also has begun including analysis of credit card transactions to help determine when digital advertising leads to real world purchases, kind of part of the same effort. Uh, they are not collecting your credit card transactions themselves, and they're not talking about where they're getting the data from, but presumably it's from companies out there who compile credit card transaction information anonymously and make it available to marketers. Google's just going to start including that data. So funny timing on this. I got a friend who works in the web uh, advertising world, and he was talking to me via email about this very thing. Oh, yeah. He was trying to understand from him what this meant. And it's all kind of what they've said it means. But he said, what I really want it to do is give us analytics on if a page is crowded with advertising, did that page was that page more likely to lead to an actual sale? Or was it less likely? If the ads were up top, did that change it? If it was on the side or if they were large square ones or if it was um, inline stuff right in the middle of an article? Like those are the questions they struggle with and they don't really have a good way to analyze that data in a, in a very scientific way. So his thinking was it'd be great if, if this could be applied that way. Now that may go beyond AdSense and that's the problem. Maybe, maybe, maybe we can't apply this to other things outside of AdSense or outside of Google Sphere, but but that's pretty interesting if we can get yeah. down to the nitty gritty of how many ads did it take for Scott to say, okay, fine, I'll buy it. And and honestly, you know, the without that kind of information, without tracking you, and I know we none of us like to be tracked without permission, but this is one of the arguments for you giving permission. Without tracking you, they don't know if that stuff works. And so whoever's got the loudest voice in the room decides how many ads get put on a page or whether autoplay video happens. Whereas if they have better data, then someone can make a reasonable argument of like, hey guys, this turns more people off than it does help. Let's, let's do something that's more useful to the consumer. Yeah, especially I'll go to some pages where I use an ad blocker or something and it'll say, you've blocked 38 ads on this page. And I think to myself, Okay, I don't know if that's some of them repeating. I don't know if that's one that's auto refreshing to be new content. Yeah, and, and bl little black pixel, single single pixel trackers and stuff. Exactly, count. but that's yeah. it's too many, uh, and and it strikes me that maybe we could hone, we could figure out a way to do it in a way that isn't so much just throw traps everywhere and let's hope animals step in the traps. Instead, let's be a little more scientific about it. I like right, that. right. No, that's a good way of putting it. The DJI Spark is about the size of a soda can, Tom. If you were looking at your soda can yesterday, the other day and you're thinking, man, that'd be cool to have a... Or, a, or a pop a, can for some yeah, of you. A pop yeah. can, exactly. Or a Coke can if you live down in the South. Right. They call everything. Anyway, this thing shoots HD video, has a two-axis gimbal stabilizer, tops out at 31 miles per hour, and can fly for over 16 freaking minutes. Um, you can also control it with your hand waving. The Spark will follow your hand, and if you wave it, uh, it will fly 10 feet uh, away, keeping you centered. So basically, you know, you're the, the point of, you're the fulcrum of what it's going to uh, orbit. Uh, you can also, uh, let's see, it will, bu 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 oh, you can also follow you as you walk. And uh, when you're done, wave and hold out your hand and the spark will land on your palm. It will know it's what like the St. Francis of quadcopters. <laughs> totally. Uh, anyway, so you can pre-order this thing if you want to right now in Alpine white, sky blue, meadow green, lava red. That's cool. And sunrise yellow. Also known as white, blue, green, red, and yellow. <laughs> exactly. I love all these screwy names. Uh, burnt umber, not included. Uh, 500 bucks shipping, uh, uh, with shipping, I guess, June 15th. So coming up faster than you can shake a stick at it. I've actually been kind of interested in a, in a drone lately. I don't even know why. I, I worry that I'd use it for a week and then quit. But maybe this is the good place to start. Because I do want some of these cool automation features that that are less than just, let me see if I can't crash this every time I try to land it. Yeah, I mean, it's half the price of DJI's next up level of quadcopter. Uh, it's also very small, and it doesn't do a lot. Two-axis gimbal, HD video, like, it doesn't have all the specs, 
but that's everyone talks about it as a selfie function but that ability to just kind of fly off 10 feet and keep you in view you know that's the kind of thing that people have been craving and and showing off in demos like oh when you're on the trail or you're going down the rapids the quadcopter can just follow along and get it get it all on film uh now it's here you can get it on june 15th it's expensive for the kind of quadcopter it is, but maybe it's not expensive when you take into account that it can do all that stuff. There's also an app. Uh, there's an upgrade package that includes a remote if you don't want to constantly use the hand waving. And it'll be interesting to see just how reliable that that hand waving is, like what the quirks are on it, but certainly interesting. Yeah. I mean, look, a thousand bucks is a thousand, five hundred is five hundred. I'll bet there is a a big market of people who did not want to go you know, full Monty on the, on the next up at, at DJI. So I think it's a good deal. Also, I think it was very telling that the Verge uh, compared it to the size of a Pele Did they say a Pellegrino? Oh yeah. I don't know if it was them that did it. Maybe it was somebody else that did that. <laughs> Might've been wired. Uh, but uh, I was like, Oh, how, how, how very modern. <laughs> You know, the old, the Pellegrino. Is it the fav flavored Pellegrino? I'm I'm totally showing my age here because my wife drinks this all the time and I can't even remember what it is, but it's it's like the hot new flavored water because it doesn't have any calories. Size of a Mountain Dew can for the yeah, rest of you. There, a potato for the rest of the other rest of you. For those of you who don't drink sugar water. <laughs> um, this one this one is put in by request from our Daily Tech Headlines collaborator, Rich Straffolino. Uh, he said, please tell me Scott Johnson is on the show tomorrow. Blockstack released a decentralized browser that can run apps off of blockchains. Do Whoa. I need to explain any more for you, Scott? Uh, hold on, let me think. Yes, please. All right, so the browser can grant access to websites using a single identity login owned by the user. Sites are loaded from peers rather than from servers. You don't need a database. You don't need an identity management system. It uses the blockchain for all of that, which means you don't have to actually put the site anywhere. It can just be distributed around and still be secure. It is in the development stage. There aren't a lot of sites yet for it. There aren't even a full browser for it. It currently exists as a browser add-on. So it's riding on the back of either Chrome, Firefox, or Safari. It's only available for Linux and Mac OS. Windows version is in the works. Current version is for developers to use, to create things for it. They want people to come up with really cool things to take advantage of this. And a user-focused version is expected in six months. Without getting into the nitty gritty of how it works, uh, which is there's a, there's a lot out there about that, what this does is decentralize so that you don't have to operate a server, you don't have to manage a database, uh, and you don't even have to do authentication. The blockchain certifies that I am who I say I am, and the site is served from whoever happens to be on and connected to the blockchain at that time so that I get all the relevant information. It is the thing that silicon valley the series is kind of messing around with this sort of mesh decentralized internet uh and also solves a lot of problems especially ones around net neutrality yeah i agree so yeah i'm gonna shock everybody here and say that i am finally starting to understand blockchain as it starts to get away from bitcoin i don't mean get away from it, it's still an integral to bitcoin but as I start to see the newer applications or the ideas that are being applied to it, it's all starting to fall into place for me. The idea of 10 years from now, all of us having a unique user identification that is purely mine, purely yours, we're living in the future, and all we gotta do is say our name or walk up to a thing or have it see our face or whatever, and this being the mechanism for uh, you know, a sort of a unified identification system across the board, it, with this level of security and from what I know about blockchain already, it's brilliant. It's the whole, totally, I totally get it. I'm on board. I'm all the way in. It's just when it deals with money, I struggle for whatever reason. It's the Bitcoin that bothers you, not the blockchain. Yeah. Well, it's just the money in general. It's like yeah. money is already nebulous and weird. We apply <laughs> value to a thing that never had value before. And well, we, yeah, that's you've it. solved that's Bitcoin right there. Exactly. Yeah. There it is. And so, so because I've always struggled with that, what I don't struggle with is every day, uh, functionality. I understand the need for me to go to a website and not have to, uh, what's my password? Shoot, it's asking for caption. I can't see that that E or whatever. Like all the ways we do it now, that would be lovely to have that just disappear into the ether and we are just, we are our security. I am my way in. BioCal uh, says this might solve DDoS uh, because 
you first of all would know where every request is coming from. Uh, they can be anonymous, but but there is a public identity. This is one of the problems with the WannaCry folks. We all know what their wallets are for Bitcoin, so we'll know as soon as somebody takes money out of that wallet. Uh, so it's going to be difficult for them to get the money out of the ransomware. Uh, cool. So so you'd be able to track DDoSs a little easier, but also you wouldn't have one server that that you can deny. You can't if you go after a site, it's just going to go get the site for you. It's not. I mean, I'm not saying there wouldn't be a DDoS equivalent attack that you could conduct. And BioCow's already moved on to like, would, could you end up DDoSing every node? But that's much more difficult and complex. Yeah, for sure. I just I picture a future where that is easier, but also. Uh, imagine you get into your car, it knows it's you. Somebody who doesn't own your car gets in, it doesn't, it can't verify it based on the same exact criteria. You're hunting rifles, your kids can't use them, only you can. Like we're into sci-fi territory in a very real way that's practical and I'm into that. So blockchain is, uh, the more it dawns on me, the more practical it gets. And the less practical it gets when it starts talking about money again for, I don't know what rates, just my yeah, own. Yeah, I, I mean, it is a big leap to go to real world objects like you're talking about, but it, but it is kind of cool to think about it metaphorically as being the same sort of thing. That's exactly right. Uh, one password, speaking of security, they're here now, man. They're here now. They introduced a travel mode that will remove all stored password and payment data on a user's device during border crossings and restore it once the travel has finished. Canada, Mexico, wherever. All password vaults are wiped when in travel mode unless specifically tagged as safe for travel. Maybe Canada. <laughs> I don't know. I'm making judgments here. The removed accounts are then synced up again once travel mode is deactivated. Travel mode is only available to subscribers of 1Password's service, not those that purchase the app outright. So you need to be part of their subscription. Um, that's a an interesting thing feels like they're taking good advantage of uh, eh, some recent events, you know, uh, trouble with well, people. Yeah, a, a lot of people uh, are worried that the the border agents not just in the united states uh but but specifically there have been some cases in the united states where people have said no you have to unlock your phone uh and there's arguments about whether that's legal or not and courts are ruling on it but for the time being people are worried hey I have sensitive corporate information on here. This has happened in one case uh, where an engineer had to unlock his phone for TSA agents who took it away from him and looked at his phone without him present. They don't know what data was accessed. He he had confidential data. He's a NASA engineer. Uh, and and so this is a way to say, look, I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna be safe because I'm not gonna perjure myself. I'm not gonna pretend I don't know something because that's dangerous. If they, they can actually bring charges uh, against you, then I'm going to remove the access. I won't know the passwords because they're stored in one password, and I will tell one password get rid of everything on the device so that I I won't be lying when I say I don't have the passwords to those things. Mm -hmm. And the idea being before you leave for the airport, maybe or or even in the airport, uh, you know, lobby, you you turn this on and it gets rid of all your passwords. Then you go through customs, you go through security, uh, and then when you're through and you're safely on the other side and no one else is going to be looking at your phone. You press a button and it restores all those passwords to you. And you can mark some safe if you're like, look, I don't really care if they have my Flickr account because there's no photos on there. I don't know. Or maybe you're like, you know what? Uh, I've got this one email account that I only use to, to talk to family. I don't mind if they look at that. That's fine. Maybe it'll keep them from getting angry. I'll mark that one as travel safe, whatever. But if you have those kinds of accounts, you can mark those safe and it won't get rid of those even when you turn on the travel protection and it gets rid of everything else. I, had a, I have a friend named Zane, went to Nigeria for a business uh, thing he had to do. He's uh, is in IT and does some training, gets to the airport, uh, goes through the customs line. They ask to see his notebook. They take it in the back room and they can they uh, then say that the only way he gets it back is if he pays a certain amount of money. So if you're thinking Nigerians and scams, they extend well beyond email, it turns out. Um, this would have been something he would have really liked to have because he may not have ever gotten it back. He ended up getting it back. There was some scuffle and people got it worked out. But had he not, or had they had it long enough to do something to it or to get into it or whatever, there'd been little he could do. So outside of the whole, I'm being truthful about not having my passwords to unlock anything side, which is good, he uh, he would have had much better, you know, had a much better peace of mind knowing that the data on this thing, which was, you know, important corporate data was not being tampered with. And that seems good. So I like this. I hope some of the other password management uh, uh, apps and things continue to maybe follow their lead. Yeah, this is the kind of thing that, uh, you know, if I'm going to travel internationally, 
I'm going to think about switching to one password uh, because this is this is pretty convenient. Mm -hmm. uh, finally, Warby Parker has an app that can help you order new glasses from them, even if your prescription is expired. Oh. In some cases, the prescription check app needs you to be between the ages of 18 and 40. So <laughs> Scott and I are out. Uh, you have to live in New York, California, Florida, or Virginia for the time being. That's where it's legal. Uh, I guess they're working on other areas. You have to have no history of eye disease, no need for bifocals. Oh, I'm out again. And have had a comprehensive exam in the last five years. So for those few of you still left interested in this, you go to warbyparker.com slash test. You pair up the website with the app. Then you stand 12 feet away from the website screen. So presumably you'd have it on a desktop or a laptop. And then you have your app in your hand. You stand 12 feet away and you take a basic vision test if your vision hasn't changed a doctor will issue you a new prescription within 24 hours and then you can spend money on new glasses from warby parker all right i like it i did this with clothes once one of those online retailers where you you know take a picture of yourself turn around do a 360 they make you a fitted shirt and i thought there's no way this is gonna work this is so dumb and it totally worked so why not a vision test I mean, I realize there's probably more legal hoops to jump through for them, but I mean, sure, it's just a chart on the wall. And if it's smart enough to be as good as my doctor at telling me what I got blurry and what I didn't, I, I don't have a problem with this. I'm sad. I'm a little sad I'm not in their, their age range because I wouldn't mind. Well, you have to have no history of eye disease. You also have to live in New York, California, Florida, or Virginia. Like they're, they're throwing you out in a bunch of different ways. Yeah, I had eye surgeries. I do not live in those states and I am not 18 to 40, so I'm screwed. Fine. I have had a comprehensive exam in the last five years. I think that's the only one of these. Well, no, and I live in California, so I have two of these that I, I, I can pass. Good more than I do. Yeah, and I, I'm wondering what safeguard they have. I mean, I guess it's just not in your best interest, right? But I wonder what kind of safeguard they have against somebody standing closer to the screen than 12 feet. Yeah, you don't. Well, unless they... So the I way that, the, the app may be able to tell, like... Through the sure. camera or something. The, the, the camera, I mean, but then that depends on, you know, do you have a camera mounted to the screen you're looking at? Like, there's a lot you of... You have the camera in your app on the phone, right? Right, right, and right. So that has to be pointed at the screen, and maybe that's able to pretty accurately tell if you're 12 feet away. But Warby Parker just, I like this about them. Even this, this will never affect me, and I'll never use it. But I like that they are more than just, hey, get cool glasses online at a few of our locations. Like, they've got more to say, more to do. They're like Pornhub for glasses. They have a lot more to do than their core business. I'm sure they love you, uh, being thought of <laughs> that way. They'd love to have the bottom line, I'm sure. Uh, to get all the tech headlines each day in about five minutes, be sure to subscribe to dailytechheadlines.com, available as a podcast, as an Amazon Echo flash briefing, or on the brand new Anchor app. Uh, Anchor has a bunch of great content from folks like Annie Gauss, who's on the show Friday, or Jeff Kanata's newest, latest, best, and of course, Daily Tech Headlines. You can get that right there at anchor.fm. And that is a look at our top stories. All right. Microsoft Xbox One game subscription service Game Pass launches June 1st, 10 days before E3. If you subscribe for $10 a month, you get access to more than 100 Xbox One and 360 games. Seem to be a roughly evenly split between the two. Game Pass subscribers can download the games if they want to play them offline. And in fact, I was incorrect, as I mentioned on TMS, there is no streaming. Uh, Microsoft says in their fact they determined that the biggest problem with streaming services people had was lack of bandwidth, so they just do downloads for this service. Uh, you can purchase the games if you want to keep them, like especially if a game is being pulled off the service and you want to keep it, uh, you can purchase them for a 20% discount. You also get 10% off of downloadable content, which once you buy, you get to keep. Uh, even if the game goes away from the service. Xbox Live Gold subscribers can get into Game Pass right now. They don't have to wait, Scott. Mm. All right, so a couple things about the announcement. Um, I was wondering for months why they had so many 360 games popping up almost daily saying, guess what's now compatible with Xbox One? Guess what now is compatible? Every day there would be a new game added to the 360 to Xbox One compatibility list. And while those were also purchasable, in some cases, if you already owned it digitally, then you could now just get it, and it was your copy on the new platform. Uh, Red Dead Redemption is one of those. There's a few others. Uh, that was always really good news and everything, but I kept wondering, who is this? what is this for? Like, Why are they actually doing this? Because in the past, they haven't cared that much about backwards compatibility. In fact, none of them do. They would rather people move on to the new platform. And I think this was it. I think they were waiting for this to launch. Now they've got enough back catalog plus current titles on Xbox One. 
Certainly nothing, you know, brand new, but, you know, a decent selection of games. Halo 5, for example, is on here. Halo 5 um, Guardians, yeah. I actually also like the idea. I kind of wish it was an option, but I like the idea that they're at least addressing this elephant in the room with game streaming these days, which is, I don't care how good your bandwidth is, it is not the most consistent experience on, in the world. It's kind of a problem across the board. It isn't just Sony. Uh, it isn't just uh, the way Steam does it. It isn't the way, you know, um, who, NVIDIA's got their service. They're all kind of crappy. At one point or another, you're going to have a glitch or a problem. It's not seamless. So it'd be nice to be able to say, well, if I don't have a terabyte internet connection, wouldn't it be cool if I could just download that copy of Halo 3 and play it? And I like that. That's a great option. I wish Sony would do this. This would be a thing Sony should do for PlayStation Now. Um, all that being said, though, it is interesting to see Microsoft positioning themselves in a couple of small ways leading up to E3 and leading up to the release of Scorpio this fall to try to take some ground back because they've lost so much of it. Um, according to uh, some numbers released in, let's see, March 16th on Venture Beat, they did a big article about Sony dominating console market with 57% share worldwide. Uh, that's huge. And that's everybody, not just those two competitors. Um, that's an enormous lead that is really hard to come back from. So I don't know if this is enough of a small step, if Scorpio is enough of a big step, but we're definitely entering some unknown territory, and I feel like Microsoft's trying to figure out how they can do it. Yeah, so so to compare the streaming services uh, is, is kind of apples and oranges. Uh, PlayStation Now costs twice as much as Game Pass. It's 20 bucks, and doesn't offer discounts for purchases. So on the financial side, Game Pass wins, but... PlayStation Now also has more than 480 games. They don't have PS4 games yet, but they did announce that they're coming. So pretty soon it'll be at parity of having both old and new games and almost five times as many games as Game Pass. So it definitely wins on game availability. Uh, the service is streaming, though, and Game Pass is download. So it kind of is what your taste is. If you've got enough bandwidth, you may prefer, prefer the streaming because it doesn't take up space on your hard drive. Uh, but the download model of Game Pass means it's always going to play without lag. So a lot of people may like that. Um, I call it a wash. It kind of depends on what platform you are. I don't think you're going to pick a console based on the service. So you're going to get a pretty good service either way. This is, I guess what I'm getting to, Scott, is this is not the thing that's going to get Microsoft to catch up to Sony. What else do you think Microsoft needs to do? All right, so there's a couple things that have to happen. I think getting some service parity or, or some service uh, competitive advantage is a good idea. I think this is a good one. I don't know if this is going to be the end-all, be-all. I don't think there are that many players that care that much about back catalog, but it's still a nice tick on the checkbox list of things you want out of a service. So that's number one. Um, I kind of wish all the console makers, Microsoft included, would quit having separate subscription services for various services. Um, if I want to get Sony PlayStation Now, PlayStation Plus, uh, PlayStation View, and uh, just regular PSN access, all of those are four separate signups. That's annoying. I don't think they even have any combined ones at the moment that I'm aware of. So I had to sign up for all those individually or the ones that I wanted. Uh, Microsoft's got similar setup with the way Live works and now Game Pass. Presumably, unless on the first we learn differently, that will be a separate thing that's sort of a separate uh, uh, subscription that you have to manage. So all that being said, as much as that could improve, getting into some sort of parity position with Sony in that way is, is a great idea. Uh, they have one strength Sony seems to have never had, and they should capitalize on this, and that is they've always had better, quicker downloads. Since this is a download-only service, this bodes well for that, than the PSN ever has. It's still a chore to preload a game on PSN, for whatever reason, if it's throttled or a thousand other reasons I don't know about, PSN is terribly slow. Um, the fastest is easily Steam. Then I'd say Xbox One, and then you get down to way down on PSN. So they could give some heat to Sony in that regard and really improve that uh, that experience. The main thing's going to be, though, Scorpio this fall being a success. It's got to launch at least at the same price or less than the PlayStation Pro. Otherwise, you're fighting an uphill battle. It doesn't matter how awesome that piece of hardware is. So that's uh, that's a big one. And they need big games at launch when that Scorpio hits. And right now, their big games are Crackdown 3, sea, uh, sea of Thieves, and I think that's it. As far as stuff you can only get on that platform coming out till the end of the year. E3, they may stand up and go, hey, guess what? Five more we didn't tell you about. And I would expect them to do so. But yeah, they need to do that. Something like that hopefully will happen at E3. But they have a lot to prove that way. And 
the third thing is harder. The hardest thing is to get with third parties and convince them that the recent shift away from them as the previous lead platform in the last generation to Sony as the new lead, uh, that they need to bring some of that stuff back. And that's really hard to convince those third parties that they need to play that kind of ball when big leagues is happening, is happening somewhere else. So usually what that is for Microsoft is them paying a ton of money for exclusivity. They did it with Tomb Raider last year. They've done it with other games where they just pay out a ton of incentive cash for certain developers or publishers to go to them first or DLC first or whatever. Um, so I think that's really important. And if it takes a bunch of money, then it takes a bunch of money. But whatever it is, that needs to really happen. But all of this, if I'm being truthful, they're not going to have a big impact with Scorpio until 2018 anyway. We're talking about ho you know holiday sales are important, but then there's a drop off. And then what? What does the next year look like? That will depend on games. That will depend on how they leverage their PC Windows dominance and combine that with their, their very loyal Xbox audience and their very loyal PC audience and somehow make those two groups work together, play together, have game parity, launch day parity, that sort of stuff. Um, that's all really important. So that may be too many parts of Microsoft having to work together to make that happen. Sony certainly has this problem across their various divisions. Although PlayStation Now works on Windows. Yeah, good game point. Game Pass does not. <laughs> uh, Microsoft's going to need to fix that. Yeah, there's a that's a really good point. Again, that parity is going to matter. Um, they need to be at least as good. And then Scorpio may have enough guts in it to say, all right, we're at least as good on the services front and the games front, but now also we're this much better because of this 4K and this kind of VR capability and blah, blah, blah. I mean, they keep talking about how Scorpio's VR uh, capable. Well, we don't know what that means. They don't have a headset in the works that we know of. Does it mean you'll hook an Oculus up to it and they make a deal with somebody? Well, like my, remember, Microsoft at Build announced all these third-party headsets, so I would expect to see more announcements along those lines, including compatibility at E3. Yeah, so... Also, it's, you know, well, whatever. PSVR has done pretty well for itself, but everything always does better if you pack it in. So there's questions about that. That's too expensive for a Scorpio launch. So I have a lot of questions about what they're going to do. But I think what we're seeing is the right direction for Microsoft. And and as much as we can hem and haw about how this generation is going so far since it, since 2013, the one big difference is this doesn't, this isn't a six to 10 year cycle. It's this new weird half 1.5 upgrade cycle uh, introduced by the PlayStation 4, originally announced for, uh, from the Scorpio announcement. That came before the PS4 Pro announcement. So they're playing a little gamesmanship there, but that's what makes this different. So they can't just count on that this time. You can throw a wrench into it and say, guess what? PS5 is coming out in a year and a half and it's going to be burp, burp, burp. And that'll make people go, well, I'll just wait. I don't need Scorpio. I'll skip that. So it is a really weird wrinkle in a very familiar tale of one company's ahead of the, of another during a certain generation and then they flip sides the next generation and that is really fascinating as someone who watches this stuff i can't wait to see how it pans out well thanks to everybody who participates in our subreddit you can submit stories and vote on them at dailytechnewsshow.reddit.com uh quick patron shout out i want to start calling out other folks doing cool things on patreon.com peter anthony holder has been doing his radio program for decades in montreal uh, the latest version of his show is called the stuff file he started it in 2009 and it's now supported directly on patreon he's interviewed folks like robert j sawyer tom arnold a man who has hitler's toilet uh, among many others, including myself, who was nice enough to have me on the show. Go take a look at the Stuff Files. It's S-T-U-P-H from Peter Anthony Holder at patreon.com slash the Stuff File program. We'll have a link in the show notes as well. Quick message of the day from Gerhard in sunny Africa on the subject of the Samsung 8 iris scanner bypass. I can see law enforcement taking mug shots with infrared cameras in the future. This way they have both facial recognition and iris bypass mechanisms. As an added extra, they can ask you to stand palms faced forward to get a good shot of your fingerprints as well. Ew, really? <laughs> yeah. I, uh, by the way, speaking of, of, of which, um, I, I said this morning, I was making a bit of a big deal about it, but I was talking this morning about, you know, Samsung should have caught this whole thing. And I've thought about that since. And you said, well, I don't know if they can or whatever. And I came to realize that's how this stuff goes, right? Company releases a thing, public gets their hands on it. And before you know it, 500 weird problems are found. There is not an authentication method without a vulnerability. Exactly. The, the, the thing that Samsung needs to responsibly do is say, okay, this isn't 
perfect, you know, but it's it's good enough for most people or something and like it, that. Should they have done that? I mean, this is a PR question, so maybe it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. they, they could have done it ahead of time a little more, you know, prepared people for it. Maybe they didn't know somebody would crack it this quick and have such a... Well, and also, you know, companies aren't going to market their thing as might be cracked. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, the, the, that, that's not going to happen, but as long as they don't overplay the security, as long as they're out there saying, and this will a hundred percent secure, it's the most secure way to lock down your phone. And I don't think Samsung did that. So. No, so, you know, and you could levy the same exact argument against, uh, Apple and their fingerprint sensor stuff and, uh, one touch and all that. It's all that all that stuff's all subject to the same problem. I feel like Samsung gets a little bit too much heat though in the in the well, back because they had a little too much heat there for a while in their note seven that's, that's <laughs> i didn't actually mean it that way but yes well said uh but yeah like it's just it's impossible not to want to go oh samsung again with the weird thing and it's i this is probably stone too too far yeah that's the echo chamber it's like ah i want to be mad at something uh it says samsung iris scanner is cracked well yeah all all biometrics are cracked uh we we haven't got there yet with them they're they're nifty but they're not they're not the most secure. Block We've also been misled by movies to think yeah, that these yeah, things no, are more secure. Sure. I'm telling you that blockchain thing earlier, that's the answer. We're going to get to a place where I just have to walk in the room and everything knows what's going on. Yeah. So. Gauchem says iris scan should mean username, not password. Uh, I don't know exactly username, but I totally am with the spirit of what he's saying, which is a second factor, not the only factor. Hmm. Uh, something you have, a picture of your eye. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, hey, thanks, Scott Johnson, for joining us, as always. What you got going on to tell folks about? Oh, it's always a pleasure. Uh, I would also point people to my regular daily Anchor show, which uh, is called The Daily Blip. You can find it at anchor.fm slash daily blip. It's all about the day's video games news and reviews and thoughts about what's happening in the gaming world. Getting awful close to E3, and when that happens, expect uh, a lot of commentary about what's going on there from me as well. You can follow all of that at frogpants.com or me on Twitter at Scott Johnson. Thanks to everybody who gives a little value back to this show for the value you get from it. We hope you get some value. That's why you're listening. That's why you're watching. Uh, and we just ask that you give a little bit of that value back if you can. Big thanks to Richard Houle, Cesar Trujillo, Todd Gaston, and many, many more at patreon.com slash DTNS. That includes you. Our email address is feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We're live Monday through Friday, 4.30 p.m. Eastern, 2030 UTC at alphageekradio.com and diamondclub.tv or at facebook.com slash dailytechnewsshow. And our website, of course, as you could guess, is dailytechnewsshow.com. Back tomorrow with Justin Robert Young. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs> Nice. It's a good show. It's a good show. I am. Uh, I'm. I'm imitating a post television. One of those little post television production company blips. Yeah, it's not trying Rick to be. Isn't it Rick and yeah. Morton? I think so. I think it's Rick and Morton. Yeah. I think it's the Dan Harmon thing. It's a good show. Yeah, it's Dan Harmon's thing. That's right. Yeah. It's my favorite one. I used to, I'm, I'm a big fan of those generally. I like logos at the beginning of movies, like production company. I love that stuff. Move your head. Just love that stuff. But the best one. No, 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 no. Uh, yes, Roger. What have we for titles? We have putting passwords on airplane mode. Hmm, that's pretty elegant, I actually. Yeah. I see what you did there, Warby Parker. I want to buy cheap crap. Not sure where that came from. Pornhub for glasses. Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt, Thunderbolt. Size of a pop can. Thunderbolt of Type C. Very, very frightening me. KV87. <laughs> KV87. <laughs> KV87. Uh, blockchain exporter. More blockchain, fewer fools. Um. Passwords on airplane mode. I like that one. That one's pretty good. Yeah, that one's pretty good. What do you like, Scott? Um, of those, I don't know. I'm bad at picking these. I don't want to pick one. I'm going to say my favorite so far is probably. I feel like putting passwords on an airplane on the airplane mode is long. Okay, it's fair. Um. <laughs> I mean, I like Pornhub for glasses, but only because that's dumb and you should never use it. Um, let's see. I'm just looking at the lower ones in case something late breaking came in. 
Yeah, and keep voting if you're watching live. Showbot.tv. Vote, 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 vote. So far, a maximum of seven of you have voted. <clears throat> and there are many more of you watching. I like the term parody matters, but they spelled it parody like a joke parody. I don't know if that's really the point you want to get across. Maybe that's, maybe it's a different, <laughs> the different comment. Yeah. Also, I always look for ones that are part of the main topic, but we don't have to, I guess. Uh, no, I've started writing uh, a better description that is more than just the main topic. That was always my hang up was like, the description would always be just the main topic. And if the headline wasn't, that it kind of disconnected. But now, now I don't have that problem. All right. Well, I'm going to, people, people are upvoting porn upper glasses. Uh, I don't know. Putting passwords on airplane mode is probably the best one. It's just riding in cars with passwords. It's just long. We'll, we'll let it marinate. Showbot.tv. Go, go, vote. Go. Yeah, let it soak. Oh, more looks got more votes. Oh, Pornhub makes a jump to six. <laughs> Unlike actual uh, uh, elections and things, these are not binding numbers, everybody. All right, I'm exporting without a title. I know, dangerous. Danger. Putting passwords on airplane mode is at the top uh, by twice as many as the next one. Yes, 50% more votes going. But is it because you didn't vote? If showbot.tv is not in your browser tab right now, make it so. Yeah, unless you're at home later, don't look it up. Right, then it's too late, sorry. It'll be empty or it'll be the next day and none of this will make sense. <laughs> Chad B says, let it merit, Nate. That's what uh, happens when Nate Langson's on the show. Nuclear password options, not bad. Nuclear Nuclear. You know how you know how I, st I used to be a nu nuclear guy. Yeah, did you? Know you? How I fixed it. All no. you have to do is pronounce the clear part. So you say nuclear. 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 Yeah, easy. easy. I used nuclear. to be a Washington, Wash my clothes guy. <laughs> yeah, I fixed it by just paying attention and not saying that. I used to hear people make fun of George Bush, uh, George W. Bush, for saying nuclear. Mm -hmm. I nuclear. To, I'd feel bad because I used to do the same thing. Vote, like vote, 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 vote. Nuclear. Get that porn up for glasses up there. <laughs> now we've got campaigns going on. <laughs> uh, putting passwords on airplane mode is definitely leading. Porn hub for glasses, make it a run. Thunderbolt of Type C, very, very frightening me. Uh, also very long. Hilarious. Probably yeah. my favorite, but maybe doesn't work as well as a title. Um, Hold of type C, very, very fright C is what it should be. Ah. It rhymes better. Thunderbolt of type C, very, very right, speedy. Because it's fast. <laughs> Thunderbolt of type C, very, very fast C. Ah, see, there you go. See? It's very fast, see? Be a good write-in vote. I want the vote. A vote for KV87 is a vote for the modified version of his title. Zoe, did I say I want to buy cheap crap and I was talking about, oh, it was the, the Ikea thing. I do. Oh, with to... the light bulbs, of course. Yeah, no, I remember now. Yeah, now I remember. Browse with blockchain. Blockchain Explorer. Tom lives dangerously. <laughs> oh, is that a new one? Yep. <laughs> yeah. All biometrics are cracked. <laughs> Game past its prime. Well, we are 30 seconds away from final export. The polls are about to close, folks. Yep. If you're already in line, hurry up. We do operate on a dictatorial model that allows us to overrule democracy when we feel it is necessary. However, I think we're going to go with the democratic results this time. All right. You go with the popular results. Yeah, the popular vote. There's the, no, yeah, no the Roger Scott Tom Electoral College chicanery. Yeah, my my porn hub for glasses would be the puppet dictator if we were to put him up there. We don't want him. <laughs> well, and Roger and I would outvote you anyway. I think at this point, so it's fine. Yeah, what? Yeah, that's a that's a kind of uh, democracy right there. It's a sort of a democracy. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, so putting passwords on airplane mode it is. Hooray! Yay. Well done. Hooray. Well done. Ad 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 Adjacia. AJC. AJC. Isn't yeah. that a AJC? It's probably AJC, right? I was trying to spell it. I was trying to get all phonetic up in there. I get <laughs> phonetic in here. <laughs> Oh, my legs. What's wrong with your legs? Nah, I don't know what it is. I need to walk more. That'll help. I just cramp it up. It's one of the nice things about having dogs. They get me out of the house. Heck yeah. Good. I get a good, I don't know, mile or more in just with the walks. Mm -hmm. I, can, I can do usually two miles, but with a kid, uh, it's two miles carrying a kid who doesn't want to walk in the same straight line. <laughs> Even with her little push push car. You know the little car that comes with the long bar in the back? Oh, yeah. Yeah. They get bored of it and want to start walking, and now you got to push this thing and carry them at the same time. My dental hygienist daughter is named Ellie, and she's a year and a half old. So she always Aww. asks me about your daughter when I go into the dentist. Tell her she's left for training. <laughs> Man, my kid's got the same big, obnoxious, hard-to-find hat head as I do. I can already see it. She has difficulty putting – I don't know. Let, let me ask you this, um, Scott. Yeah. Since you were there for your child, child children's upbringing. Mm -hmm. uh, did you ever come across the, uh, an issue where your kids' heads were too big for the shirt? Like you tried to, like you know, at the one or two age, you try to put it all over their head. And yeah. you complain about it going over their head. Yeah, their heads they get all bent back and yeah. they get mad. Yeah, that happened. But I mean, because the hole's too small, or it looks like it's too small. Right. I usually chalked it up back to our hat discussion. I usually chalked it up to their heads being too big, and the shirt wasn't really at fault. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. But like maybe I don't know. I'm still bummed about my my hat not fitting. <laughs> I gotta return it now or something. Give it to Jen. I have a really great Green Bay hat that I love, but it is so tight that I will have a migraine by four if I wear it. I don't have a hat like I had that forensic unit hat, and that hat was sweet because it fit my melon to a T. It was a flex fit hat. It this it worked. It worked. And now I can't find it. I misplaced it. Maybe I left it at a restaurant. I don't know. It's the I'm worst. Just kind of pissed. I'm voting for Tom Lives Dangerously just for fun. <laughs> I picked our thing already, but but why not? I think everyone should push that one up. Pick up a 25 inch head, which is a huge head, by the way. Pretty big head, yeah. It's... You're probably about mine. I'll bet we're about the same. Yeah, but you're also six one. Yeah, it helps to be stretched out a little. I'm not. I just look. I look like I'm an orange with it on a toothpick. People a look fat at, toothpick. No one looks at me and goes, "Oh, but he has a big head." It's when they just when I try their hat on, then they're freaked out. They're like, "What? Like that doesn't fit." So somehow I've op I have an optical illusion going. Yeah, because you're six one. Yeah, it helps. You don't. Uh, I don't know. I just got a big head. It's pretty obvious. I don't know. Actually, what's weird is you only notice it if I'm standing next to someone who's like Patrick. Compared to Patrick, I have a ginormous noggin. Patrick. That or Patrick just has a very small head. Patrick Beja or Patrick? Or Patrick uh, Norton. Yeah, Patrick Norton seems. But see, here's the thing. On camera, Patrick Norton seems like his head is enormous. When you meet him, though, it's not. It's like a little orange. <laughs> <laughs> Like a peanut. Uh, <laughs> all right. Enough talking about peanut heads. That's right. melon. Enough of this melon talk. Melon yeah, talk. we're we're uh, bordering dangerous territory. <laughs> put on my perfectly average seven and a quarter inch hat. Whatever. I have the same um, problem with shoes, but it's a take a drink from my gun mug. <laughs> Oh my god! I wish Come I could on find my knitted brain slug. You know, I you know you know what you know what really grinds grinds my gears to borrow a phrase from Peter uh, Griffith is that 
I can't just other than pants. I really can't go into a store and find stuff that actually fits me. Like I don't want to. I'm not bragging, but I got a pretty wide chest, like torso. So if I get a shirt that actually fits me, so it doesn't pinch my armpits, the shirt comes down to like my knees. <laughs> You know what I mean? It's just like, it's weird looking. Or if I do get one that fits, it just looks odd because the the uh, cut is meant for either, uh, I, just, I basically look like a kid. Like, it just looks stupid on me. Like, I'm wearing a kid shirt because this is shirt. So, but I'm like, I just can't find anything to fit. I'm the most ungainly person to clothe. I think that's most people, though, because I don't have that unusual of a body type, I don't think. And even then, I can't. I go in. I know my size, my inseam, and my waist size, and I try on pants, and they don't fit because the numbers don't mean anything. I, I don't know. And this is the only reason. It's, I, I'm not ashamed to admit. I wear Levi's five hundred ones because their sizes. Like I know what my size is, hasn't changed in like the twenty years, twenty five right. years. And, the, and you know, from that manufacturer, it's going to be yeah. the same every time. Yeah. No, I hear you. Um, that's, you know what, uh, I started buying the Mr. Collection service where they just send you clothes and you wear them and send them back yeah. and you get to keep ones and buy them from them. If you like them, I have found more pants that way than I ever have going out and shopping. What's the service again? The Mr. Collection. Do they do hats? <laughs> you know, I think they do occasionally do hats. I've never gotten a hat from them though. This is, I've always wanted to try this. You've, you've liked it. Yeah, I get good stuff from them, and you, and and they've changed it since I started it now, so that you can send it back as many times as you want. Um, it doesn't make sense for everyone because it's not cheaper necessarily. But for me, it was like I need different looking clothes for videos and stuff, and this is better than going out and constantly buying. Yeah, all the time. and then yeah, then you then now you're in charge of figuring out what to do with the stuff you're not going to wear anymore or whatever. Yeah, right. And this way, I just I just like I'm going to wear this shirt is from the Mister Collection. I'm going to wear it today on the show. I'm going to wear it on the Tech Republic videos, and then I'm going to send it back. I don't have to keep it. Interesting. And it's and the selection's good and all that. Yeah, they've been pretty good. You can give them feedback too. I wish they had a better feedback system. You have to. You have to describe what they sent you and then say what you like. So I, I often forget to go back and give them feedback. Um, it's not as nice as Trunk Club in that respect, but Trunk Club is so expensive. Yeah. And it's and it's a shopping service, not a try-on service. So Trunk Club, you can't wear the shoes, for instance, because they're like, you know, you you we're giving this to you to buy. And if you don't want it, send it back. Don't wear it. Right. Whereas Mr. Collection is meant to be worn, and then you just send it back to them. All right, uh, that is it. Thank you, everybody, for watching, listening, enjoying. We will talk to you later.